Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now, to your host. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Anti-Corruption and Governance Center podcast. My name is Ben Schmidt, and I'm a program officer at SIPE's Anti-Corruption and Governance Center. And today I'm joined by Bill Steinman, who is a lawyer and a corruption specialist, specifically in the area of cross-border corruption and compliance, and by SIPE Africa Program Director Lola Adekanye. She also runs the Anti-Corruption Accountability and Governance and Integrity Programs in Africa. That's quite a mouthful. Lola, good to have you on. Bill, it's great to have you with us. Good to be here. Great to be here. So today we have a really interesting discussion about On the one hand, a not FCPA, actually, it's instead it's an enforcement action based on a count of conspiracy to provide support to a foreign terrorist organization. But that has everything to do with compliance, corruption, corporate culture and ethics. And then on the other hand, a parallel earlier case that was FCPA that has some interesting parallels. So just to get started, Lola, can you tell us what was the Lafarge enforcement action and who are the main players? What are we talking about here? Thank you so much, Benjamin. And, you know, it's it's interesting. I think just a few days ago, I put up a post referring to an old blog, I, blog post I did about six years ago. And the title of the blog was provocative in a sense, but it was real, which is basically asking, is your company aiding terrorist activity And in Africa? And the reason I was asking is because, you know, at the time, and it's worse now, there's just a lot of insecurity and, and vacuums of legitimate uh, government, you know, security in, in many parts of the region and more so around the world. And it's only a matter of time before a company becomes a victim to aid in terrorist activity, knowingly or unknowingly, right? And so this case is about foreign foreign uh, corruption, as you said. It's also about just that intersection between the economics of terrorist activity and legitimate economic activity. And so the Laf- Lafarge case is a very recent one, which just uh, last month, I believe, the DOJ put out the press release explaining basically what transpired in that case where Lafarge, a company that's headquartered in, in Paris in France, but does a lot of work around the world, especially in emerging markets. Lafarge has, a, I know I, I'm in Lagos right now, and I'm sure I know Lafarge has a big operation here in Lagos and parts of, uh, parts of the region in Africa, but they are a building and manufacturing firm, especially Siemens is what they manufacture. And they opened this factory in Damascus sometime in 2013, 2014, uh, a plant, a cement plant, to keep that plant open when terrorist activity increased in that region. They essentially found themselves making payments to two terrorist groups in the region worth over, I believe, $6 million thereabout over time. But the, the intricacy of this case is, is more telling. It's telling about that slippery, slippery slope that companies experience when they have to do business in high risk, but even volatile, you know, environments. And it's a bit worse than that. And, you know, I, I want to, you know, pass this on to Bill to talk about a little bit because, you know, Bill's, Bill's experience is in these kinds of high risk regions and with companies that want to operate in these regions, but really have to have very strong risk management and risk mitigation systems. But beyond that, there has to just be a strong commitment to ethics and integrity, what they would do and what they will not do when they are faced with ethical dilemmas. And I think that's something that's interesting you see in Lafarge. Perhaps they started off with a strong commitment to integrity and ethics. I see that on their website. They have a strong policy around that. But how they ended up being almost business partners with a terrorist organization that at the time you know, was really wrecking havoc in the country where they had this plant is something we definitely should learn from, right? So so that's kind of a summary of the case, a very high level summary, but I'm eager to do a deep dive and and talk a bit more about the parallel case that uh, that you mentioned. Yeah, that's perfect. Lola and Bill, could you just give us a little bit of a perspective of kind of what happened in the, the Syria case 
with Lafarge. What went wrong? Well, it, a lot went wrong, I think, is the, is the best way to put it. From the very beginning, Lafarge, as Lola indicated, established a large cement manufacturing plant in Syria, and their timing couldn't have been worse, through no fault of their own. They completed the plant in about... Uh, it's 2010, mid, wasn't it? And they, yeah, that's correct. Mid to late 2010. It's a $650 million plant in 2010. That, that's right. So they made a substantial investment, and unfortunately for them, the plant commenced operation not terribly long before the Syrian civil war commenced. And they were in a region, uh, the plant was in a region where gradually various warring factions take over. And in the wake of those warring factions taking over and control of the central government in Damascus waning, as we all know from watching the news back in the day, gradually two terrorist organizations start to operate and control territory in the region around the plant. The first is uh, al-Nusra Front, and the other is ISIS, Daesh, both of which at the time were designated by the U.S. government and numerous other governments around the world as terrorist organizations, which of course they were. And those designations, both in the United States and in other jurisdictions, carry with them pretty significant economic restrictions, as you might imagine. Essentially, U.S. and, and, and other laws flatly prohibit any kind of economic or other dealing with organizations that have been designated as terrorist organizations. Now, this put Lafarge, and in particular its operations in Syria, in a terrible bind, because what starts to happen after these two extremist groups take over the region around the plant is they start harassing Lafarge's local employees. They kidnap employees. They st- set up checkpoints that prevent people from getting to work. And in one instance, uh, a Lafarge contractor is killed at a checkpoint uh, by extremists. And Lafarge is essentially stuck between a rock and a hard place. They've put this sizable investment into the plant. They've got a large local lo- workforce who so they don't want to just abandon. And, and yet they are concerned about safety and a desire to continue operating. And what they ultimately do is work with a business intermediary who was actually previously one of their partners, a local Syrian company, in establishing the plant to approach the two extremist groups and make financial arrangements to ensure the security and safety of their personnel. Now, let's be clear. There are a whole host of legal problems with doing that. There are no exceptions under U.S. anti-terrorism rules for dealing with terrorist organizations in the name of safety for your own personnel. And certainly that puts companies like Lafarge in a bind, but the rules are, are what lawyers like us would refer to as strict liability. You don't require intent. If you engage in the activity, regardless of whether your motives are pure or not, you're in trouble. And that's different from from other related laws, in, including the FCPA. And we can talk a little bit more about, about that. But when dealing with a terrorist organization, you just don't really have an opportunity to, to say, we, we want to protect the safety of our personnel, so we're going to start rendering protection payments. So there really isn't any wiggle room here. There's no wiggle no, room for an organization to pay a terrorist organization, according that's to correct. U.S. law. That's correct. Um, And and at the risk of of digressing, under the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, if the security risk comes from a government, right, an official government, the official security forces, the officials who are responsible for keeping the peace and running the economy and the like, there is the ability to render payments to protect your personnel under what's known as, uh, it's not really an exception, but, but what's known as duress. Right. So under the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, to be held liable for making bribes to foreign government officials, you have to have intent. You have to be you have to have criminal intent, the intent to do something corrupt. If a company's employees are facing threats from official government forces under U.S. criminal law, if you make those payments because you're making them under duress, the law deems you to lack criminal intent. So you can't be held criminally liable. But there's no such exception 
under U.S. anti-terrorism laws, which, of course, puts a company like Lafarge in a bind, right? And this is sort of a circumstance that the law doesn't neatly, isn't neatly designed to address, because in this circumstance, right, Daesh and, and the El Nusra Front had assumed the mantle of government. They were running and in the region and engaging in governmental activities. In their minds, they were the future government, right? But unfortunately for Lafarge, they really, from a legal perspective, weren't the government. They were a terrorist organization. So they were damned if they did. They were damned if they didn't. Indeed. They were, they were forcing threats and kidnapping and death from the ostensible government of the region or the, or the two most powerful organizations in the region. That's right. And so ultimately they decide to make, for the want of a better phrase, a, a devil's bargain, right? And, and I think, you know, in hindsight, there, you know, there's some degree of sympathy for the dilemma that they're in because they've got local personnel who are in terrible danger now living under the jur- living and working under the jurisdiction of perhaps the most notorious organizations on the planet. And Lafarge is sitting in Paris saying, what do we do to protect these folks? Um, we can't abandon them. It wouldn't be moral or appropriate to abandon them. So the company decides to start rendering payments, uh, essentially in the form of a tax based on the amount of cement that they sell or the amount of vehicles that are bringing in supplies to the plant. They make payments through their local Syrian business intermediary to ISIS and to the al-Nusra front. And before we go too much farther, I actually wanted to pause and, and ask, so how does this situation thus far, the story thus far, a company operating in a foreign, dangerous foreign market, there is an organization nearby that has government-like power over security over life or death and quote unquote devil's bargain is made to pay them off so that they, they stop threatening, they allow operations to continue. How has this scenario taken place in other places and times around the world? Specifically, what happened in Colombia in the late <laughs> yeah. 90s that was similar to this? And Lola, have there been any other cases, say in the Africa region, where this sort of a situation arises and foreign companies are forced into devil's bargains or or feel like they've been forced into a corner and have to strike a devil's bargain? So that's a great question, Ben. And, you know, I, I, I would like us to talk about the very, very different but similar case in the Chiquita Banana one. But let, let's talk about one in the in the Niger Delta region. And before I go into that one, and that's the oil producing region in Nigeria, I just really want to say, I think If you read the entire Lafarge case, it's really hard to be sympathetic for the decision or the position that the executives were in, you know, because unlike the the Chiquita Banana case, which perhaps we should dive right in, you know, right after this other case, Lafarge started off. So every company does a risk assessment before going into a new market or new operational territory, right? And at the time Lafarge built this plant, it already knew what it was what it was going into, right? There wasn't there was serious contention for the role of the government, the, the government that provides security for property and lives and livelihood could not really do that at the time. So they were threatened by these terrorist activ- ter- terrorist groups. As of 2010, all of the FATF Financial Action Task Force bodies, especially the one in the MENA region, had already published lots of patterns for how terrorists extort funds from companies to continue to operate. And it's exactly this kind of security payments that's a very common model, right? So Lafarge should have been, if they were not, they should have been aware of what they were going into. If you also read the case, you'll see that they faced competition from cements imported by companies in, in the in neighboring countries. And those imports were lower than Lafarge. And so Lafarge went beyond just paying security payments, you know, what could have been termed duress payments. They went beyond that to even striking a deal with terrorist groups to say, hey, you know what, we're going to split the profit. If you if you try to, if you make it difficult for our competitors to bring in the, the goods that we sell, you know, we will give you, they basically said, look, you guys are not taking advantage of another 
business model here, which is rent seeking or which is, you know, we, we, why don't we introduce you to another way to partner with us? And, and that, that, that's extreme. There are a few other things Lafarge did that makes it really hard to think that they tried to do what's right. And, and I've, in other regions, in, in the South South region in Nigeria, where a few oil companies, at least a particular one I remember, uh, Shell, one of the Shell subsidiaries, had to deal with local groups of youth demanding, you know, that they abide by certain corporate social responsibility standards and otherwise they'll vandalize the property and, and harass the, the employees. And the company disclosed this to the SEC and to the DOJ asking for guidance and trying to make sure that they had you know, all their uh, documentation to protect them if they were ever accused of paying a bribe to this group that had no name or, or violating foreign corrupt practices, uh, the FCPA, because these groups were protected by local police authorities. But eventually what they did was they had to pay police authorities to protect them, right? And they had to s create an agreement, a contract with the government. So it's not like they're paying for, uh, you know, a set to get an advantage over others in the community. So it's not always a clean way out of these things. But if, if, if the organization's philosophy around ethics and integrity, around doing what's right and what's fair and what's equitable and transparent, if that strongly guides the executives who make the decisions when they face ethical dilemmas like this, you will know. You know, they will not do what Lafarge did, which is like sell the company off to another company to say, hey, look, take on our problems. And there's something called successor liability and they didn't disclose it to this company. Then they backdated <laughs> the agreement. It's all just it doesn't look good for the Lafarge executives. But yeah, the, the Chiquita Banana case is definitely one that you the one you mentioned that we should talk about so we can see how that's different from from Lafarge's Lafarge's case. And just before we do that. Lola, it's interesting how we're we're describing company decision makers, executives that are at this fork in the road. They're facing threats. They have business investments. They they have the ethical or 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 moral dilemma of what do I do to protect my investment, to protect my employees. But what you described about the Syria case is that they had already gone out on a limb by investing in a country that they knew was dangerous. And they had perhaps unwisely done it because they were uncompetitive. There were Turkish imports of cement that were actually lower priced than them. And so they had layers of moral dilemmas and of questionable decision making that that weren't exactly defensible to start. How was that different, Bill, from what happened in Colombia? Yeah, no, it's interesting. In Colombia, and this goes back to 2007, Chiquita, who, of course, is one of the world leading producers of banana agricultural output. They had a number of banana producing farms, groves in a region in Colombia that in 2007 became very unstable because of a variety of kind of right wing militarized factions not affiliated with the government took over the region or at least destabilized the region and started to threaten Chiquita personnel and told Chiquita pretty explicitly, if you don't start rendering protection payments to us, this, this, these right-wing groups, we'll start to harm your personnel. So you can sort of see that, that where Lafarge starts out from, you know, they've got, they've got a non-governmental extremist group operating around their assets where their personnel live and work, and both face threats from these organizations and, and, and face the the dilemma of, I need to protect my personnel, that's the responsible thing to do. And the only way to do that is to essentially make protection payments to extremist groups. And like Lafarge, right, who was, who was dealing with al-Nusra and Daesh, the, the militant group that Chiquita was threatened by had also been designated as a terrorist organization by the U.S. government. Ultimately, Chiquita decides, look, the the safety of our personnel is, is paramount, and we're not going to leave these folks out, out to dry. So Chiquita starts to render payments to this militant group to protect their personnel, and they do so through business intermediaries, which always seems to be a feature of these, of these, of these cases, uh, as well as kind of plain, you know, plain vanilla uh, FCPA cases as well. 
and and as companies do in these circumstances, you know, Chiquita sought sought legal advice, and they were told by their counsel that you'd get into trouble if you did this. But they decided to do it anyway. Um, and like Lafarge, right? There's no exception under these sanctions regimes that deal at, uh, with terrorist organizations. So Chiquita went into this knowingly. They knew that. If they got caught, they were going to get in trouble, uh, but they thought it was the right thing to do. They did get caught, and they had a, a variety of other problems. Um, usually when people make payments of this nature, they don't write them down in their books and records as you know, payment to right-wing military group that's sanctioned by the U.S. government, right? They describe them as consulting payments and security payments and things. They obfuscate the real nature of the payment, which is a whole separate set of legal problems, but but focusing focusing on the protection payments, when Chiquita gets in trouble. They made a very good faith effort to defend themselves and said, look, we, what would you have had us do, U.S. government? Would you have had us leave our employment employees in the region, you know, at the mercy of these horrible groups who were very explicit, right, about the fact that they were going to harm these folks? And essentially the U.S. government, because these sanctions regimes are strict liability, there's no intent requirement. It's a binary, right? You either don't do it or you do do it. And if you do do it, you are in trouble and there is no defense. And so Chiquita gets into trouble. And of course, the U.S. government got a lot of criticism following the Chiquita case for that very reason, right? They, they made these payments for all the right reasons to protect personnel and not, not to enhance its business or the like. And really, the U.S. government doesn't have a great answer for that. They simply say, look, we, we understand that and they said this to Chiquita. We understand your pe- people were in trouble, but that's that's not our area of responsibility. We here at the U.S. government have these rules. We're responsible for enforcing them. And you made a lot of payments to a terrorist organization. So we're going to find you. What didn't happen is what you're telling me, Bill, is you're saying that Chiquita didn't go to these far right military groups and say, hey, so who are your suppliers? Who do you work with? What 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 portion would you need of our profits in order for you to give us access to greater markets to you know maybe more banana forests like what other lands do you do you control that we could harvest bananas indeed and then and as lola said that's really the tipping point in lafarge these two cases start start off looking very similar but at some point in the lafarge decision making process at a very high level in the company by the way the folks who had approved making payments to ISIS and al-Nusra to protect the local personnel, ultimately start to look at this and say, well, now these folks are in charge of the region. We are making payments to protect our people, which we might look. And it's funny, the settlement is full of quotes from emails where people say this is terrible, but we don't have a choice. At some point, that decision goes from that you know, kind of place of, of, of moral concern to, well, maybe there's an economic benefit to be gained here. We've already got a relationship with these folks. Maybe we can work with them not only to protect our personnel, but to expand our economic footprint in Syria. And you're quite right. And as, as you and Lola mentioned, they start pursuing agreements with these organizations to convince them to impose essentially import duties, higher import duties on imports of cement from places like Turkey and elsewhere, so that Lafarge's products were more competitive, they were cheaper. And, and indeed, what, what's so rem- you can't make this stuff up. The settlement materials include reproductions of agreements between the company and ISIS on ISIS letterhead, which I didn't know was a thing that existed. Uh, but I guess, you know, ISIS thought of itself as the new government. And so they had letterhead, you know, and, and at some point, while I think we can construct and be comfortable with or maybe, well, we can we can be sympathetic to the dilemma of having to protect your personnel and doing so by dealing with some unsavory characters. I, I think few, if any of us out there are sympathetic to then pursuing economic relationships with the world's most notorious terrorist organizations purely for economic benefit to expand sales and, and expand one's, one's footprint. And that's where things go off the rails. So the next time you see a Lafarge advertisement, you can, you can think like those Hollywood movies where it says, from the producers of Monsters, Inc., 
when you see a Pixar ad, <laughs> you'll see from the creators of the ISIS Lafarge cement plan for Syria. Yeah. I, I this think is that, Lafarge uh, coming to you. I, I think they are now working very hard to overcome that. And of course, as, as Lola indicated, they were then acquired by, by another a large infrastructure manufacturer, Wholesome. And indeed, Lafarge didn't disclose this to Wholesome during the during the merger or the acquisition talks, which of course ultimately gave Wholesome a lot of heartburn. But Wholesome, you know, did all the right things. They discovered this. They, you know, initiated a, a, a robust investigation. They disclosed these issues to the U.S. government and have spent an extremely uh, robust amount of time, effort, and company treasure to 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 make sure this doesn't happen again, and to make it clear that that um, you know, this was an this was an aberration and not not their standard way of doing business. So hopefully they'll avoid these problems in the future. They've also dismissed all of the people who were involved in it. Thankfully. So Lola, I want to jump back to you as we come to the end of our podcast here. So what are the takeaways? And and as as SIP works with small and medium sized businesses uh, that have international partners, what can we learn from these? from these cases, the Lafarge, the Chiquita, and the, the Niger Delta case that you mentioned that are kind of the major ethics or integrity takeaways here? There are a lot of them. So let me try to summarize them a little bit. And I don't want to put a dump out on how much fun we've had talking about this. But, you know, just sitting here in Lagos, I'm thinking back to a train attack by terrorist groups that happened earlier this year. And, you know, lots of young people, old babies, you know, were taken away. I think some young children lost their lives. But it, anyway, these terrorist groups basically were kidnapping these people for ransom. And that they got the ransoms. And what happened expectedly is the case of terrorist strikes and, and, and um, bombings and suicide um, bombings, that sort of thing, increased because they had more funds to continue to operate, Right. Uh, and, and that's the reality for companies that aid and abet terrorist activity, because the risk with corruption is it creeps on you. It creeps in on you. It's some people say it's a victimless crime, you know, so Lafarge is doing the business of selling cement, but their business of selling cement is enabling these organizations kill people, destroy lives and, and livelihoods at scale, you know, so that's the reality. The takeaway, and, and with that in mind, the takeaway, you know, for SIPE is this, you know, we work across entrepreneurial ecosystems, we work on anti-corruption issues and governance issues, and we know that private sector, we, we strengthen private sectors so that private sector's contribution to democracy creates peace and creates, you know, stability in, in different regions. But in conflict regions, it's hard for private sector to operate. So in countries where we're not yet at confl in conflict of the, the nature that, you know, that Damascus is in, it's important to engage in the democratic system to preserve the peace. So for small businesses that, depending on where they operate, may not be in conflict zones because there are small businesses that probably operate in Damascus. They have no choice in some cases, but to pay protection payments, to make protection payments in some cases. Now, in other regions where small businesses just operate. It's important for small businesses to know that they have a strong responsibility to prevent corruption because over time, corruption corrodes the system and leads to conflict in the, in the long run. I always like to use the analogy of an ice sculpture. If our country is an ice sculpture and trying to protect it and you put it in a, in a nice room and the room is at 10 degrees, uh, for, for instance, every time you, you, know, you turn that heat up, you may not see that you're eroding the, the integrity of the system of that structure. Let's say it's your democracy, but that's what's happening. So every business, including small businesses, uh, have a responsibility to not turn the heat up, you know, try to keep it at that 10 degrees and engage in um, civic activity, uh, strengthen their compliances. They have a responsibility internally to strengthen their own compliance systems because they are the companies that will grow into a Lafarge. And if they don't have a strong ethical uh, system while they are small and growing, it's only a matter of time they will expand to the neighboring country where there is, you know, terrorist activity and they'll they'll be a Lafarge. The the second quick thing is from a compliance perspective. I imagine Lafarge had compliance officers. I do not want to be a Lafarge compliance officer right now. 
in any Lafarge subsidiary anywhere in the world. Nobody in the compliance industry takes any Lafarge compliance officer seriously right now, and it may not be their fault. The tone at the top was rotten. So they could have written all the memos, they could have done all the training, they could have done everything that they know to do, but the tone at the top really just eroded um, eroded anything that they could have done. So to compliance officers, I say, <laughs> you know, you have a strong responsibility to really be an activist in your organization if you can be, right? Your activism will speak for you. So for compliance officers who may have kept the memos and letters that they, they wrote while they were, the emails while they were in Lafarge, even their lawyers too, keep them. You know, you might be bound by confidentiality or, you know, rules, but keep them because that's what tells me that if I'm hiring a Lafarge compliance officer tomorrow, they will, they know their onions and they'll do their jobs, right? So we train compliance officers every day and we have a network, the Africa Business Integrity Network that is full of compliance experts. And and um, we have Ethics First, of which Bill is on the advisory committee. So I hope that companies listed on Ethics First would never be in this situation. But, you know, I, I suppose that's, I should more than hope that. But the idea is really to start early. I should be certain. I should be able to say no matter what happens to the board of directors, there's strong stewardship around what the business philosophy is. And executives in the company, at least half of them will never go along, will walk out in protest if a company decides hey, we're going to go, in, go into an agreement with, with a sanctioned company. So those are my takeaways. Start early for small businesses. Start early for compliance officers. Your reputation and everything is on the line um, for any company that you work for. So know your onions and do your best uh, to keep the company out of trouble. Lola, I think that point you made about walking away is, is such an important takeaway. When when you see what the U.S. law asks multinationals to do, it doesn't matter if you sp if you spent six hundred fifty million dollars on a plant. It doesn't matter if you you know have these fields of bananas in a foreign country and you have people there. If you're paying a terrorist organization to protect your people, you're just giving that terrorist organization more resources to attack and to kill and to destroy. And so the math doesn't add up. Right. Who you're paying to protect is is not sufficient to justify paying an organization that's just going to to destroy people at scale like you said and we laugh but it's laugh to cover up from crying because what what really happens in you know when an organization is is that evil or that horrible or that you know life destroying is is horrific absolutely absolutely you hit the nail on the head yeah bill let's give the last word to you and we'll we'll wrap up oh thank you you know i just drawing on on what Lola said, I I think you know we're, we're certainly in an era of that's been called sort of the period of compliance revolution. There is without a doubt among multinationals, among SMEs, among governments that focus government agencies that focus on enforcement, there is increasingly a focus on compliance, putting resources and effort behind avoiding violations of law. I think what what primarily went wrong here is a failure to appreciate that compliance not only means compliance with law, but compliance also means ethics. And that what is ethical business conduct is, I mean, here it would have aligned with, with the legal requirements, but that companies ought to ask themselves and ought to structure their systems so that they not only say, what does the law require? But they should consistently ask themselves, is this the right thing to do? Is this the moral thing to do? And there doesn't seem to have been, at least it's not reflected in the materials, a lot of asking of those questions. Once they got past making the payments to protect their personnel, which I think one could, in a sense, one can conceive of as having some degree of, of, of morality, at least coming from a good place. But, but starting to, to work with an organization like this to expand your business footprint there is no moral component to that. And so what we always advise our clients to do is don't just think about it as compliance. Think about it as compliance and ethics and make sure that you're taking into account not only what the law requires, but what you know to be right and wrong. That's a perfect note to, to end on. Thanks so much, Bill, Lola, for joining us on this, on this podcast today. 
and we'll see you all next time. Bye-bye. Thank you. Democracy That Delivers has been brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. For more information, please visit sipe.org.